Russia's masterly victories over the Hun at Stalingrad and in the Caucasus make it almost certain those overwhelming Soviet campaigns were planned as long ago as last autumn when these pictures were taken. They show units of the Red Army fighting in the defensive phase of their grand strategical plan, now carried to such a magnificent climax. The Red Army's deeds are only one side of the story. Another army was at work behind the enemy lines, elusive, matching the Hans' brute force with cunning. The Russian guerrillas gave their enemy no respite from battle. Russian villagers, men and women, I and children too, fought an organized battle of wits, knowing well the certain penalty if caught, death. As this Nazi spy discovered, the motto of the guerrillas is, no quarter expected, no quarter given. The deeds of these simple country folk who choose grimly to die fighting rather than submit to the invader will rank high in the role of honor when the full story of the war comes to be written. Unshaven, emaciated, fever-ridden, yet still tough as Australia makes them. These are some of the troops who beat the Japanese at their own game in the steaming jungles of Papua. How they fought that long, grueling struggle through swamps, over mountains, in almost impassable jungle is an epic of human endurance. The Australians are loud in their praises of the Papuan natives, who uncomplainingly carried every item of equipment over country where roads are almost unknown. Full of admiration too for their unselfish devotion to the wounded, carrying them for days through this sort of country. There's a dramatic reality about all this that cannot be escaped. Cheerfulness and courage contrasting sharply with suffering. Rain, sheeting down every day, monotonously from the sultry tropic skies, turning everything to a sea of mud. Then came the Americans to join up with the Australians. They built their own bridges, made their own roads, cutting their way through virgin country that up till now has probably never been explored by white men.
much of the urgent supplies were dropped from Douglas transport planes flown by men of the Royal Australian Air Force. By air, Port Moresby is just an hour or two, but carried overland, these essential supplies couldn't have been delivered in under six days, and uncertain, hazardous days at that. Fresh troops of the AIF, with splendid battle records won in the deserts of the Middle East. Here, in the streaming forests of Papua, they had to learn very different tactics. Here it was a cat and mouse game against the wily Japanese who fought back bitterly every inch of the way. Here in Papua, it was kill or be killed. Rapidly following on the momentous conference at Casablanca came the news of Mr. Churchill's flying visit to Turkey, accompanied by prominent statesmen and leaders of the fighting services. At Adana, he was joined by the British ambassador to Turkey, Sir Hugh Natchbull Houston. Britain's Prime Minister had come to Adana for discussions of first importance to both Turkey and the United Nations, for all of whom Winston Churchill was empowered to speak. The conversations took place on a railway siding, and there the British Prime Minister was received by President Inanu of Turkey. Turkey has never disguised her resolve to resist with all her power aggression from any quarter. Neither has she ever wavered in her loyalty to the British alliance. The official communique on this visit said that agreement was reached on the manner in which Great Britain and the United States would be able to help Turkey materially to consolidate her own general defensive security. Adana has strengthened Turkey's resolve and has set the seal upon her security for the duration of the war and in the peace to follow.